Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 641, that's 641 of the Agostino Zynga show featuring I, your host Agostino Zynga. I hope you are doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you are doing well. How am I? All good, all things considered, I'm not gonna lie. This past weekend was another weekend spent indoors. No going outside for me. No oots, 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 oots. <sighs> Anymore, <laughs> right? I was just chilling, relaxing, having a good time at home. And my body has recovered for it. I think the continuous gym sessions, the late night staying up and recording, the editing and clipping and uploading of clips and making those thumbnails and all that stuff and reading and bloody blah, 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 blah. It does take it out of you. I'm not going to lie. So if anything... If you are trying to avoid going out, if you are trying to avoid, you know, indulging yourselves in stuff that occurs at night time, if you're trying to avoid drinking or drugs or all that sort of malarkey, a really good way to avoid all those things is to have a lot on your plate. Like purposely put things on your plate that make no sense. Like, you know, working out all the time, like running all the time, like thinking of cool, interesting projects that you can spend your money on all the time, like thinking of cool places to travel, um, going to exhibitions, going to private views, visiting museums, going away on a weekend. Do all these things, include them on your plate. And quite soon what you will see is that the times for you to go crazy and to really indulge in some of your vices will kind of slip by because you don't want to be waking up the day of the event you're going to hung over mash up and not in the mood to go you want to go there with a good attitude you want to go there clear-minded you don't want to go there stinking of booze stinking of whiskey stinking of beer you know smelling of all sorts of drugs you want to be awake and alert and on it and i found the more often i put stuff on my plate the better i am and if i think back to my peak years right because i think most of us peak years i know mine have kind of drifted by you know with the combinations of pandemic and lockdown and whatnot but if i look back to my peak years the peak when i was really really up there doing my thing the time when i was up there doing my thing was when i had loads of things on my plate when there was no time to really go out and indulge myself there was no time to really go out there and go a bit crazy because i had so much on i was doing weekend races I was traveling all over the place. I was hanging out in all these cool different spots and whatnot, checking out different things, absorbing it all in. Don't get me wrong, my output wasn't as good as it is now. I feel like I've got way more output. I'm shipping a lot more often than I am talking and pontificating about things, which is definitely something I'm happy about. But long and short of it, put more things on your plate and you too shall be busy like I am. You too shall be busy like I am. Another thing I noticed, having gone back and watched some old clips of this show and seen how it's slowly but surely building, slowly but surely building, there were times when the full show would get like 10 views, right? Now it's getting up to about 200, 300, 400, which is nice considering it's an hour of me blabbering. The downloads on the MP3s are pretty healthy too, so I'm happy about that. So it's going in the right direction, you know, little bits of effort. What I'm happy about with this show, what I'm doing is I hope for some people this shall be like an example and an opportunity to see how it, long it actually takes, right? When you don't have anybody, like as a cosign, when you don't interview people, as I, as I don't do on the show so I don't have that kind of you know added benefit of you know basically boosting my stats by having somebody well on well known on that goes well people start looking back on my other catalog and also somebody that you know I would say I go out of my way not to ask anyone for help I go in my way to kind of prove that I can do on my own it's a little bit stubborn it's a little bit blind sighted it's a little bit blinkered it's a little bit narcissistic it's a little bit you know delusions of grandeur all that stuff mixed into one you know uh, it's just a little bit you know overinflated ego whatever but that's just how i'm built unfortunately it's kind of a blessing and a curse sometimes a curse more so sometimes a blessing but i hope this can serve as an example of just how long it takes to build something from the ground up and the steady race needed because i've not i think yeah, I can't think of any actually. Well, why would I do that? Yeah, I can't think of one. But I don't think there's one episode on this entire platform that I've got in terms of my, you know, YouTube channel where I do my video portion of the podcast I listen to via the audio one now. There's not one video that I think I've uploaded on there that's been added. I've bought views for not one. Everything on there's organic. 
So even if it's, I'm talking about clickbaity stuff or things are in the news, whatever you're seeing, there's organic traction that I'm kind of building up over time. If you go back, just scan back to like, I don't know, a, 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 an old episode that has like, you know, what, what episode I can think of, I don't know, episode number 200 or something or 215, you'll definitely see an increase in the overall views in my full show. Because I think I was always getting pretty decent views on the clips because, you know, clips always do well because they're sh much shorter and easy to digest and easy to listen to. And if someone doesn't really trust you with, it, with their time, it's easy for them to kind of take a chance on the clip than it is an hour you know plus four episodes of a podcast but if you look back at some of the older episodes you'll see some of the views are way lower than what they are now so clearly i'm building and going right away but it definitely does take long because i'm 641 episodes in soon to hit 700 and still i don't think i have a single i don't think i have one i don't think so i can't can think but i don't think i have a single full show yet that's over a thousand views I haven't checked in a while, but I don't think I have. So that goes to show that the grind is slow, but eventually you will get there. So I'm happy about that. And in general, anyway, in general, forget all the stats and stuff. When I started this, the primary, re the primary reason why I started this, I think if you go back to episode one, you can actually hear me saying it as I'm recording it for a Sony dictaphone sort of thing. The primary reason why I recorded this or why I did this podcast was for my own mental health. At the time, I was really 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 going a bit crazy i was talking to myself like way too much like to the point where i was having full-blown conversations and i thought you know what instead of doing this and looking like an absolute weirdo why not just press record and then you know frame it around some topics that i'm interested in and then put it out there and see the people other people like it or not and that's how it basically got started but it was really getting bad like i was legit having like conversations with myself all the time so when i joke about it and say i've got no friends ah, ha, ha, i'm being for real i'm on my own most of the time apart from when i'm with a couple of people but from apart from that i'm on my own all the time and i spend way too much time on the internet i spend way too much reading books way too much time watching weird documentaries so your brain ends up going through this weird spiral and sometimes like most of you feel i'd imagine you listen to this pod sometimes you listen to somebody so long you legit feel like you know them so sometimes i'll be listening to a pod and i'll be answering questions that the person's like asking out loud thinking they can flip and hear me and stuff right or like you know arguing with something they said or some hot take or whatever it's just like dude get a grip they can't hear you they don't know you they don't care but hey we're going in the right direction <laughs> we're going in the right direction little but surely he's little but surely anyway what was i doing over the weekend over the weekend i obviously wasn't out so i was staying in and stuff and enjoying inside life for the first thing i did actually was watch tulsa king i've been binging a bit on that it's a really good TV series starring Sylvester Stallone. Let me not say it's really good. It's an easy watch. If you're struggling for something to watch and you're into mob type uh, dramas and whatever, I always call it a thriller, mob type crime dramas, then I definitely recommend you check it out. Especially if you're into those kind of ones that have those really interesting twists and turns. Can this person be trusted? What's this person's intentions? What's their motivations? Um, is there somebody that you haven't kind of paid attention that you should really be looking at in terms of being a threat to somebody? It's a really good um, TV series. I think the overall premise about it is that um, Sylvester Stallone's character is a guy that was in a mob and he basically went to prison for like a long period of time. I think it was like plus 20 years or something but he didn't snitch it in route didn't do anything and he held it down he comes out and it's a whole different world when he comes out so you know there's iphones there's social media there's uh identity politics and the drug game has obviously changed so he's trying to basically adapt to it at the same time and then as he lands back to you know be welcomed with open arms to his crime family they basically tell him that he has no um you know he has no business being in a town that he's from he has to go elsewhere which is why he goes to Tulsa and they want to set him up shop there it's hard to kind of get him out of the way because they feel like he's too much of a big presence and he might kind of um what's that word called he might step on a few toes and he might question some people's authority who have been placed higher than him even though they're younger so they kind of want to get him out of the way by sending him to Tulsa um and then kind of hoping he kind of withers away but of course this guy Sylvester Stallone's character being the G that he is he ends up kind of you know uh, making Tulsa his home and taking over the scene over there it's not really a spoiler alert, but it's basically the general premise of it and it kind of follows his journey through there through race politics religion family um it's really cool I, I like it to be honest it's not don't get me wrong it's not it's not super intellectual it's not super you know um it's not super dynamic it's not going to change the world in any kind of way shape or form it's not going to change tv the way you know it it's no sopranos it's no wire 
It's not Breaking Bad, don't get me wrong, but it definitely is good enough for a little bit of a binge watch. And since the first season is out, and I think they picked up the second season, I definitely recommend you check it out if you're struggling for something to watch. Tulsa King starring Sylvester Stallone. And his acting isn't the greatest, but it still shows way more range. And it kind of made me think about the kind of, you know, the burly, um, you know, action man type of character trait that I guess The Rock is basically trying to do. And I feel like Sylvester Stallone, especially considering how limited I feel like his acting range is, he does get the most out of it. Of all those people out there, especially considering his age as well, because this guy's an old man. I think he might be in his 70s or whatnot. And he looks great in the show. He carries himself well. The writing's not cliche and silly and dumb. He sounds like an adult. Do you know what I mean? It's, I don't know. I just like the show. I like the show. I recommend you check it out. Tulsa King. Obviously, you can if you find it wherever you find it. I watch it in the places I watch it in. I'm not going to tell you where, but you know you'll be able to find it if you know what about those shows. And the other day, I want to talk about another show that kind of left me a bit disappointed. Um, it's kind of really upsetting that all these kind of limited series always have really terrible finales. And what I'm talking about is Echo Free, which is a really cool. Um, at what well, it started off being a really cool TV series that essentially depicted um, some really interesting geopolitical stuff, some really interesting stuff around the war on drugs, about civil war, about drug, about drug trade, about family dynamics, about manhood, like you know all these female empowerment. There's loads of really interesting themes carried through Echo Free, but for whatever reason, they completely shit to bed when it comes to the finale. And it started off with so much promise, really did start off with a lot of promise. And the show essentially centers around um, a couple, and one of the, you know a couple, which is basically a guy and a woman, and the guy is a Navy SEALs. And the woman is, um, I guess she, you know, for, from an army family because the brothers are decorated, because her brothers are decorated army Navy SEAL. No, let me just start, let me rebound that again. It's, it's a dynamic of two, just, it, it starts off the whole premise of the show is that you've got these three people. So you've got a brother and a sister and a guy. The brother and a sister, one of the, the, the brothers of Navy SEAL. And then the sister ends up um, liking and failing heads over heels with a guy who is essentially the son of a businessman who sells arms, right? He's an arms trader. He does like high tech weaponry and stuff. It's also the army. He ends up, she ends up falling in love with him. The guy ends up weirdly falling in love with her brother in like a weird kind of brotherly way where he kind of looks up to him and he also wants to be an, a Navy SEAL because he feels like his life is directionless because he's the son of this rich billionaire, you know, um, arms dealer guy. He just lives, you know, life of, of hedonism and just, um, you know, whatever else and luxury and whatnot and doesn't really have any purpose. So he wants to join the army and then he joins the army off the back of that relationship and they both go, you know, to, to serve their country. But of course, the dynamic is kind of a bit weird because obviously the girl doesn't want to lose her husband so soon in the war. They go to a first deployment and that first deployment, they go to unfortunately tragedy erupts and somebody from their platoon unfortunately dies off of their squad. And the brother kind of blames himself because he prioritized bringing his brother, what's it, your brother-in-law, I guess, I guess he prioritized bringing his sister's husband back home than taking care of the guy that was obviously stranded as well. And that kind of led to some tension between them, blah, blah, blah. Um, we don't also we find out later in the show that the lady is also like a undercover sleeper cia agent woman thing half and half a half of a scientist a botanist i think and she heads out to somewhere in central somewhere in south america forgot exactly where to go and investigate something about these leaves and about their health benefits and then in the midst of going out there she's obviously going out there to try and have gather intel for the cia and in the midst of it a guerrilla group of people um, who are basically trying to overthrow the government, take her captive, and the whole entire premise of the show is the brother and the husband basically, you know, burning everything in sight and killing everybody in sight in effort to get their sister and respective wife back. But along the way, there's some really interesting stories there, a lot of interesting threads, a lot of interesting themes. Uh, but for whatever reason, when it came to the absolute finale, the absolute final episode of this limited series, which I think might have been like eight episodes, I forgot how many episodes it was, don't, don't hold me to it. But it was really a big letdown, to be honest, a real, real let letdown, the end of the series, a real, real big letdown. Some of the dialogue felt so forced, it felt so weird, um, it felt so self-indulgent. 
it didn't feel like it was really um centered or based on any kind of real reality not reality even that they create from themselves all the tension and the aggression and the aggro and the spice that you felt beforehand kind of just left and they kind of went out with a bit of a whimper i'm not going to lie really good and for something so badass and considering what they did you know to get to that point at the end it just felt like a real anti-climax and it's a shame like i said because these are limited this are these are limited series right these are series where they essentially put them out under the premise of this is only going to be a one season show with a limited number of, of episodes and that's going to be it we're going to tell a nice concise tight story and be done i think of a good example being zero 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 which was adapted by the fan ad, 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 sorry a tv adaption or the fantastic fantastic book written by roberto saviano who's um you know um really amazing investigative journalism kind of led to the downfall of the Cosa Nostra out there in Italy and he really details a lot of that their inner goings on and politics and whatnot and loads of really interesting topics around you know drug smuggling and whatnot especially cocaine and I really recommend you check out if you haven't before and the, that series for it 000 was really well done I thought like and that series so that series in particular why I really give it a lot of props is that they were telling a lot of stories. They were telling a lot of stories through different people's POV and they were still able to tie it together into one concise, really well-rounded show. Whereas Echo Free, for the most part, tells the story of these three people, um, you know, with different motivations and whatnot, but it's just three people that you're basically telling a story for and they still couldn't tie it together. And I felt like it was a bit of a waste opportunity when you think about the amount of money that was spent on this because it looks like a lot of the stuff was filmed on location, so they flew out to wherever they were. I don't know if it was Peru, Venezuela, Chile. Don't get me um, held on what country it was. Or maybe I think it was Colombia, one of those countries. And they flew out there. So everything looks like it was filmed on the location. And they must have spent a lot of money on this show, Apple. And for whatever reason, the finale was really real big letdown. But again, you know, there's not much on TV nowadays. So sometimes even if something is passable, it's enough to be entertained and watched. So I don't know if you're a fan of stuff like SWAT, if you're a fan of stuff like Spooks, um, then I definitely recommend you check out Echo Free. Uh, you know, available now on Apple TV. If you want to check that out, available now on Apple TV. Then, of course, I want to move on to this news. This was all over my piece of social media because i follow people who are you know balls deep in the nightlife scene and whatnot and partake in electronic music like I do. And this is featuring this headline cursor of Mixmag. It says the following. London night czar Amy Lammy received a 40% pay rise amid a Capitals club closure. Amy bloody Lammy, the London night czar here in my hometown, London, got a 40% pay rise, a 40% pay increase to be very precise in language. Despite her being absolutely terrible at her job, despite her having no real, you know, demonstra no real demonstrable, um, despite having no real evidence of any success of any long-standing changes um that have really kind of been implemented since she's been hired in this role i think since 2016 or 2017 whatever it may be and if anything just a real waste of space and for one i want to start this off before reading the article i really want to know if people out there are way more educated than i am when it comes to politics is this Amy Lammy job as a night czar? Is this a permanent job? Is this one of those MP jobs where, like, is this like being an MP where it's like a job for life? Or can she ever be voted out? Or is this intrinsically tied to Sadiq Khan's um, London mayorship, which doesn't seem to be ever over as well? That just seems to be rumbling on and on and on. I wish we had term limits when it comes to that sort of stuff. I don't know if it just keeps getting voted in or what's not. Again, I don't really pay much attention to politics, but I would like to know, is Amy Lammy's job a job for life? And if not, can she ever get voted out or fired? Like, what is the deal here? I just want to see a fresh face. And again, don't even imagine she did a good job. Even if she did a good job being a London Light Czar and she has to advocate for some really interesting um, new, you know, um, regulations and stipulations and whatnot and initiatives for London clubs and dance music in general. And she worked hand in hand with clubs to kind of find a way to kind of mend the relationship between local councils. And she did amazing things. Don't get me wrong. Imagine she did all that. I'll still want to see somebody new just to offer a fresh and interesting take um, on what's going on here in London because I feel like the issues in London although they're the same they keep changing in some way shape or form so you maybe need some clever approaches to kind of rectify some of these issues um, again to you know to kind of pull a hand out there um, to mend some relationships to build some bridges 
um, to maybe establish communication, just a fresh, interesting voice would maybe add to it. And she's had long enough in the hot seat, get somebody else in to do it. That's all I ask. And again, it's just, if it's a job for life, it's a piss take. Hopefully it's not. And it's just a temporary one because I don't think she's done a good enough job to even have a job in the first place, let alone deserve a pay rise. So it continues here. This is um, first reported by The Spectator. Her salary has risen from £83,169 a year pro rata to £116,925 as a result of two pay bumps. One in September 2021, following a review of her role, and another in 2022 in April, which came as part of Greater London Authority GLE annual salary increase. Okay, so the one salary increase that she did get was based on her performance. So they looked at her performance in 2021 and said, yep, you've done a good enough job. We're going to give you a bump. And the other one was in line with what everybody was getting in the GLA, which is Greater London's Authority's annual pay increase. Fair enough. The funny thing about this 83000 that she was first on, this was a pro rata salary that she was getting for working part-time, if I'm not mistaken. I think the first two years, or maybe one year of her role as London Knights are, she was getting paid £83,000 to work part-time in London as a night czar, which is essentially what she's doing, like sitting in local meetings, um, in some council meetings from time to time and what? And saying what? Like introducing herself and saying key buzzwords and whatnot. Like what has she actually done? Like legitimately, what has she actually done? You hear a lot of stuff about this flipping 24-hour London nonsense. We've got a 24-hour tube. But what is the point of having a 24-hour tube if there's not one 24-hour club in London? Not even that. Forget that. I've, I've, I've said from the very beginning, I think for sure, for sure, London by bare minimum, at bare minimum, should have one fold in each part of London, north, east, south, and west. There should be at least one. And when I mean one, I mean what Fold was originally sold to us as. When Fold originally launched, you can look at some of the old articles, just Google them. You'll see a lot of the initial articles about Fold was that it was going to be London's first yeah, London's first 24-hour club. Obviously, that didn't transpire because of local issues, probably council issues, noise, permits, licenses, who knows. There was a time and period when the Fold founders were arrested slightly because of some fraud, you know, cyber crime thing because of some equipment that was bought with some illegal funds, blah, blah, blah. So there's been issues there. So maybe that was the reason why. But that was the reason why it initially launched and that was kind of what his main selling point was but obviously that hasn't happened and you know they have some 25 licenses that they dot around a year it's not many i think it might be six maybe less than that i'm not too sure but regardless fold should be open 24 hours more often than six times a year it should be open 24 hours every year every weekend to be honest in my opinion there's no point in having a space like that and having it where it is situated in the middle of a warehouse in the middle of nowhere basically not near to any real neighbors or not and anything they've got a good crowd management in terms of getting people away from their areas so they're not loitering around the place good transport connections there's no reason why that place shouldn't be open 24 hours but it isn't so the fact that they kind of keep rabbiting on about this 24-hour flip in London and whatnot because the tube's open late at night and you can take the tube all the way through the weekend, cool, amazing with some lines, you don't have any clubs that are open. And again, it folds to one place, you have to have them at least open in each area of London so that you can ease the pressure and attention that's been placed on London transport and that's been placed on cocktail bars and other clubs as well. So you can kind of spread it out a little bit. And also what that does, I think in my opinion, is that it kind of alleviates some of the issues that we have around antisocial behavior when it comes to drugs and alcohol. Because I've had a long suspicion, my long-held suspicion and belief is that, especially after having gone to places like Berlin and, you know, partied in one of the best cities for nightlife and clubbing culture in general, I feel like because we have such limited hours to drink, it kind of forces us to get really leery. And then by the time we go to a club, especially if you go to a smaller town, like one time I went to visit a friend in Hastings and it was a real kind of eye opener when I went there because the pubs would close before 12. So some pubs would close at 11.30, 11 p.m. So people would go there to try and get smashed and usually the pub landlords to get more money during the weekend would run special promo deals on shots or beers or whatever else drink they wanted to run a promo on. You'd get laced up with drinks in the pub and then you head out to a cocktail bar usually that opened until one whatever right because you want to get something a little bit more hard maybe a little bit more straight to the head and then from then you'd go to a nightclub i don't know what nightclub it was out there but it was some club we went to that was only open until four but by the time we went to a nightclub we already been to two other drinking establishments and we were forced to drink within a four to five hour window very short time to neck those drinks back and by the time you hit that club you are steaming 
you are steaming, steaming, steaming. Eyes pinging all over the place, sweating profusely, drunk, smelling like an absolute bar. You're a mess. So clearly that would obviously, you know, not be the best condition to be in if you wanted to be on your best behavior. But if you have a 24 hour club, it lets people spread the night out a little bit, spread the drinking and the drug taking out a little bit. Like you see what happens in Berlin. People don't go too crazy. Even when I go there myself, I spend usually the first time that I, the, the first night that I land, I spend most of it just like, you know, seeing the sights, taking it all in, drinking some flipping um, malt beer, so, sorry, some malt drinks or whatnot, drinking some juices here and there, and then getting on the sauce later on in the night because there's a lot more time to go. But we don't have that because, you know, Stuff is so constricted it's annoying anyway we continue her hire in november 2016 was much celebrated at the time no it was not a complete lie no one celebrated it. everyone was kind of apprehensive when she got hired i think because the first part about it which was really annoying was that if i remember when they put the night czar announcement out it was an open application and i'm sure many people within nightlife who are really knowledgeable who have experience who have loads of really cool insights and fresh ideas they probably submitted the application and none of them got picked essentially they picked her and if i'm not mistaken she's a long time labor supporter and stuff she's worked in politics before in some sort of level so if anything it was basically an inside hire even though they opened it to everybody else which is probably legally what they had to do but they just basically hired somebody internally so no one was excited for it especially when you saw her it's like come on what does what does she know about london nightlife she's not even flipping from here obviously she's a citizen but she's flipping american if i'm not mistaken um, yeah i think she's american i'm pretty sure even out canadian but she's definitely not you know whatever and then you're here and then you're like what her experience is what like putting on parties in camden and shit like come on man running a sh radio show no one listens to come on this is a nonsense anyway continue with her role involving championing london's nightlife both in the uk and internationally including safeguarding venues across the city according to gla's own website however she has faced scrutiny during her tenure from time, sorry, within the industry, particularly as venues struggled during lockdowns and now the cost of living crisis affecting running costs. Yo, she was so quiet during the pandemic. She was so quiet. And again, none of it was her fault. She couldn't anticipate anything and she couldn't really have done much. But the lack of real insight, support, empathy, um, just speaking in general and dialogue was so shocking. She was so quiet. That really was a bad PR for her, to be honest. But hey, what can you do? Latest figures from the nighttime industry, the NTIA, um, dated from June 2022, showed a 37% fall in the number of nightclubs. So we had 346. Now we only have 221 since December 2016 when Lamy was a month into the job. God almighty. Uh, Michael Kill, the CEO of NTA, told Mixmag, in the current landscape where the industry is in crisis and the nighttime, in the, in the nighttime economy businesses and jobs are being lost across the country due to inflation, sorry, in the current landscape where the industry is in crisis and the nighttime economy businesses and jobs are being lost in the country due to inflationary price pressures, industrial in action and downturn in the trade due to consumers having less disposable income, it is inevitable if it is true that many will find this news extremely hard to accept. Of course, it's but the, anyone getting a pay rise in you know in, in the climate we're in at the moment is going to get scrutinized anybody just because people are hurting out there and to see people getting mad pay rises and bonuses you know working in industries where you know people maybe question what they actually do you're going to have a bit of a fit but for somebody who we definitely know for you know for because especially most of us who are really interested in, in electronic music and in nightlife in general we've been keeping a key now on what's been going especially if you're in the uk you've been keeping one eye open and what's been happening um you've seen all these clubs closing down you're seeing issues people having with licenses and whatnot and you're looking at this woman and you think yourself like what do you actually do what is your actual job are you just like a waste of a hire are you stealing a living are you just you know um i don't know like are you a psyop like what the hell is going on here it continues. However, we know that the NTE, NTE advisors have hugely important roles to play in supporting the sector across the country, and as organisation will continue to campaign for these roles implemented in every major city across the UK. Political answer of Michael Kill. I don't. I, I don't. You know. I don't begrudge him. He is the CEO of the NTI. He can't go ham on her. So he's basically saying, hey, we need more of these roles across the UK for sure. What would be good actually? is if we had more night stars across the UK. We have already Manchester, Liverpool, Newcastle, and I don't know, wherever else, Brighton, Bristol, I think of anywhere else that has kind of good nightlife scenes and whatnot. And what will be good and interesting is if we get other night stars who do a demonstrably better job than her, and then we can compare and contrast. 
because at the moment there's no pressure really because who are you comparing it to like the one that does in Amsterdam or something do you know what I mean it's hard because we don't really understand the posters over there and we're not paying attention but if people at home base if there's an example to show somebody is in a job for like only six months and they've implemented this they push forward this they're doing this they're doing that then it will definitely show how bad of a job that she's doing but at the moment there's no one really to compare her with and because the industry is so messed up anyway it's hard to really claim it's hard to really pin all the blame on her because she can only do so much but still she doesn't try to do anything do you know what I mean she's clearly like you know there's like hey you know you know you work in certain companies and you get into an issue and you think HR is meant to be there to help you, then you quickly realize, no, HR is there to protect the company from you, actually. That's what HR's kind of, you know, main sort of uh, um, person they're looking after is the company that actually hires them. But in your naive head sometimes when you're going through issues, you think, no, they're there to protect me. It's like, no, 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 no. You're just a cog in a machine. They want to protect the machine. So maybe that's what she's doing. She's clearly went in there and just, you know, she's kind of playing the role well and abided by everything, not really trying to ruffle any feathers and just really not doing a damn thing. Um, it continues. One much discussed part of Lammy's role has been the introduction of a night sur surgeries where she meets the Londoners to discuss their experiences in life in their capital. Absolute waste of time and absolute bullshit. But the Spectre reported that the GA's website only 27%, 27 previous surgeries have been listed since the beginning of November 2016. So don't even do that. An average of every two months, no surgeries have been reported since 2022, nearly 10 months ago. So these surgeries that she probably sold as some sort of big thing to kind of talk to real Londoners and get the real opinions on the street and whatnot, she hasn't done in 10 months. Stealing an absolute living. When asked about the seeming lack of night surgeries, a spokesperson told Mixmag, the night star speaks with businesses, organisations, boroughs and Londoners every single day. No, she doesn't. Between the hours of what? Uh, to, help the to help London thrive between 6pm and 6am. Lies. This includes regular meetings and roundtables of business groups, councils and industry associations covering all aspects of the capital at night from the support uh from uh, sorry from support for the pub sector and music venues to safety transport policy and planning issues night surgeries are organized together with local authorities to meet residents and community groups businesses counselors night workers volunteers to hear their views and challenges that they are facing across aspects of london at night these surgeries are a small but important part of Amy's work and that is why she has organized more night surgery in 2022 than any previous year. I like political talk. She will continue to hold in-person and online surgeries that are part of her wider work to support the capital at night and deal with the pressure of facing industry following the impact of the pandemic and the cost of living crisis. In July 2020, as clubs grew close a pandemic restriction, the petition was launched to remove Lamy from her post which gathered 1,000 signatures. She has had her share of success with the GLA pointing out the launch of a women's night safety charter waste of time nighttime enterprise zones waste of time and scrapping the form 696 discriminatory risk assessment that require promotes to disclose the efficiency of the artist okay that's pr pretty good um yeah her overall record has faced criticism from members of the nightlife community including producer um caris stockat who says sorry but what the fuck um does have amy Lanning done apart from safe venues that she personally djs at she's done absolutely f4 for the capitals nightlife and was absent during covid get rid Music journalists, okay, we don't care about journalists. Um, the Night Zara job description was independently reviewed to better reflect the responsibilities of the role as part of the restructuring of the mail's office. The post has then graded using GLO's independent for grade 13, grade 15. The Night Zara is responsible for helping London's thrive between 6 pm and 6 am. That's so what I'm saying. She hasn't let her thrive though. Where's the other clubs that are open between that time in London? Apart from flipping, what, fold, egg, fabric. I can't think of many others that are open like that. And again, we need them in each area of London. There needs to be one at least. There should be a fold in each part of London, a minimum of one. And it should be open 24 hours every single weekend. Simple as. There's no excuses. This includes advising the mayor, deputy mayors, and the mayor advisors of all areas of policy to planning, blah, 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 blah. But anyway, the, the story remains. I actually want to know. Can this lady ever be fired? Will we ever be rid of her or is she going to be here forever and ever and ever? Is her role intrinsically tied to Sadiq Khan's mayorship? Can she be voted out? When will the next round of Night's Eye elections go place? Can we put a different criteria in place and maybe objectives in mind when they hire the next person? Because, you know, for all the ills that she's doing, it is pretty nang. It is pretty cool to be able to make 83,000 to 100 and 100 pounds doing absolute jack shit, right? Doing a radio show no one listens to 
partaking in crappy meetings that no one probably turns up at where you probably get to comp and expense everything that you eat um traveling on a comp traveling on a you know on taxpayers dime and all that sort of nonsense and living a good life and pretending you're helping these venues when you're clearly not and putting out crappy press releases and whatever it may be when people question everything you have to say absolute dog shit hate everything about her hope she gets fired hope she we lose her in some way shape or form but i also can't hate the game of her being able to finesse the situation given the you know the the current situation we're in in the economy finesse away but you are hurting me and i'm pissed off because it's hurting the things that i'm interested in but i don't hate the hustle i cannot hate the hustle it's impossible to hate the hustle because she's absolutely caking while doing absolutely nothing crazy isn't it it's hard to imagine imagine having imposter syndrome so I, I can't believe people i don't understand people who have imposter syndrome in the 21st century there are so many people out there legit stealing a living even at your place of work right now there's somebody that you work with who does the bare minimum every day and still has a job still has an income still is able to you know look after themselves their family or whoever it may be there's people out there legitimately doing let's not even count all these flipping you know um finagle and finesse ceos of startup companies that don't actually do anything they use them as a flipping weird scheme to launder money or to raise funds to do other things illicit things or they squander all the investment cash like pollen did i'm glad they're dead r.i.p to you you know resting flipping piss and all these things how can you legit have a imposter syndrome on all these people who are demonstrably you know evidently objectively terrible at what they do how can you have an imposter syndrome because you got given the role of social media manager because you got given the role of marketing manager because you got given the role of you know um hr director or something and you're young and you're maybe inexperienced how can you have imposter syndrome if you're actually good at what you do right that's already you're already better than 50 percent of the workplace out there that you're actually good at what you do plus that you give a crap plus that you have standards plus that you're easy to work with that you deliver on deadlines you should never have imposter syndrome in that regard never there are people out there legitimately stealing a living stealing a living they're only there just because they're older right or because they hanged around long enough and stuff like that kind of thing and they're not good at what they do at all in the slightest and if anything they're the ones probably holding people back as well because they know they're crap at their job so they don't want people to come in and expose them how crap they are at their job it's an absolute madness but yeah um in in one way bigger up in another way hope she gets ousted sooner rather than later because her flipping you know tenure as london nights has been an absolute disaster in my opinion <sighs> a little water break there let's continue so next thing first i wanted to quickly talk about is the bergheim february lineup it finally dropped it's been a while i don't know what actually happened and why it took so long um initially the only bit of the lineup that was available was the ctm festival lineup which you know i probably haven't got enough time to actually go out there in general to enjoy and most of the artists playing that are not really to my taste but i was waiting for the entire list to come out and it took a while usually it comes out if i'm not mistaken before the 10th so if you yeah it's, it's like the pre previous month before the 10th so it's usually you know it would have come out sometime before january 10th for the february lineup and it didn't it was a bit late I'm not sure why maybe they're short staff maybe they were trying to get lineup done i'm don't know if it's conspiracy theories let them fly but regardless the lineup is out finally out and i've got my eye on a date here which probably will be the 25th the only thing that's a bit weird about the 25th of, uh, to go Bergheim is that for some reason on that weekend there's no panorama bar there's no finest fridays or whatnot um it's just a straight up Bergheim on the saturday but nothing on a friday that might mean there's a private event happening on a friday or something that they've hired it out for i'm not too sure or maybe a shoot or something or maybe a concert who knows but it's a bit disappointing because i would have liked to have gone there on the friday also because now i've seen that panorama bar has a specific wristband that they give out to people i, I actually might actually put a picture but upload it so you can see what it looks like but there's a specific wristband that you get when you go to panorama bar, which i didn't know because i think last time i went there i'm pretty sure last time i went there i didn't get a specific wristband i'm pretty sure it was just a regular burger wristband so the fact that they do specific ones that's a different color with a different design them is pretty cool just for the you know novelty side of things i would have liked to have got that but that's not going to happen so it is what it is but the saturday the 25th of february is looking very tasty and considering the lineup i'm really really eager to see a lot of these people playing main room berkheim you got speedy and steve playing live you got rural halal you got dj maria drum cell eat up kyle polygonia and rod 
in Panorama Bar, you got Ada, Chaz Demir, you got Francisco Manduni, Massimiliano Pellegrino, you got Peach on Fuse, Roy Perez, Sam Goku, and Tur. Now, the reason why I really like this lineup and why people should be giving Bergheim more credit than probably they do get, especially in recent times, considering all the issues people are having with people cutting the queue, with the queue lengths and how long they take, the rising price in entry, the rising price in drink, which is definitely something that's happening as, you know, the you know, we're in this kind of financial squeeze at the moment. There are loads of things to kind of point out, the things they're doing wrong. But one thing you can't deny is that they do a lot of things right when it comes to selections in terms of the scale and the kind of reputation of the club the fact that they have somebody like a dj maria again because i love to you know google some of the people who play and see who they are because some people i don't really recognize some of course i do but i wasn't really familiar with dj maria so i kind of searched her online and i'm pretty sure i found her profile and it's a, a young lady I'm not sure where she's from but she does have many followers maybe a thousand or so followers her soundcloud isn't you know that popping off whatever it may be she has i think some appearances i'm pretty sure on on whore i'm pretty sure i saw one on whore if i'm not mistaken maybe it's poly polygonia but regardless she's not that well known and she's playing at Bergheim. same goes for poly polygonia um unless maybe you guys know them more so than i do but they're not that well known they're not that super famous but they're playing in one of the biggest clubs in the world and i think that's something that a lot of smaller clubs especially in london don't even do some of them will never let you play there unless you put a night on so you have to kind of you know take some financial risk or whatnot have some skin in the game for them to let you play behind their hallowed decks but for whatever reason Berghain is able and willing to kind of sniff out and kind of get people playing you know at their club who are essentially unknown which is pretty insane if you think about it for the scale you'd think that they'd be like you know really um tight and really kind of you know nose in the air about who plays there but from what it looks like if you've got the right connections if you've got the right friends to introduce you if maybe the you know the person that books the um the djs in general stumbles across your page or likes what you play when you've been you know featured on horror or something you could have an opportunity to play a burger and it really is that easy um and it's pretty cool to see that there is an avenue there is kind of a route to get to that level because obviously myself you know coming from where i'm coming from that's the obviously the end kind of goal the end kind of dream that's when you're doing is okay cool you're definitely going in the right direction when you've kind of got a booking in that way and there's something that i'm definitely kind of aiming for sometime in the future no rush whatever happens it happens i love things to kind of just evolve and to kind of you know develop over time as they do happen in kind of the natural flows of life and sometimes opportunities kind of falling up in a weird way i kind of look back to that weird story i remember reading um on finn johansson's blog back in the day where he was talking about some club night that he put on where one of the djs i meant to be playing i think was ill or had to go home and some random person in the crowd jumped on the decks and kind of went back to back with him and then he left that person to play and then he went home and that person played all the way until the early hours in the morning now it doesn't happen all the time it's a bit of a no it's a bit of a you know no it's a bit of a it's a bit of a random story but i still love the whole idea about something like that just happening in the moment you know where these kind of you know all these things align at the same time that person going home someone being in the crowd who kind of understands what you play is willing to play and plays until you know the basically nice end i thought that was pretty cool to see and that's something that i've definitely i'm definitely kind of more in tune to because the whole kind of forcing things and sending emails is just you know it's lame and it's not really needed um when things are meant for you they will definitely come your way so it's definitely something i'm kind of looking forward to but again like i said it's really encouraging when you just see people on the lineup list of Berghain and non-flipping panorama bar who you don't really know too much about they're not that super famous um they're not got super big followings online they're not big massive social media stars or whatnot but they're still able to play in one of the most biggest clubs um in front of some of the most well discerning audiences known to man and i think that really goes a long way to kind of you know um really show people that there is a way to kind of get up there and kind of traverse that path so that's definitely something that i'm currently looking forward to and of course to see ches damir playing at panorama bar will be sick if i'm not mistaken that also be an opportunity for him to see him maybe promote his new ep that's out now at the moment so i'll be pretty sick um the return of roy perez who i haven't seen that panorama bar in a while but i remember seeing him and dr rubenstein play you know panorama bar before and i always enjoyed that oh no i saw him and uh, rubenstein played sorry at uh, flipping burger in main room so that'd be pretty cool and sam goku being on permanent vacation i'm pretty sure i'm going to enjoy that set also so loads of really cool interesting people to check out and be kind of on the lookout for so i'm definitely eager to check that out and see that happens when it happens on 25th so really 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 eager for that one and then we have this we have 
an opportunity for me to go to Cocktail de More, and I haven't been here in years. I think the last Cocktail de More I went to might have been a couple of cocktails before the last one at the original Grease Mule. The, yeah, that might have been one of the last ones I went to. So the original Grease Mule, which is definitely one of my favorite clubs ever in terms of a space, in terms of a hang, in terms of a chill, especially for someone like myself who normally goes to you know Berlin on my own. I normally go on these kind of solo weekend techno adventures and whatnot where I kind of just book a random weekend just to kind of head out and go on a bit of a techno trip and see whoever's playing out there. Now I'm kind of planning stuff out because, you know, I don't want to waste my time or I don't want to go there, you know, when there might be a good event happening here in London. But before I'll just pick any random date and just go and then see what happens because usually as long as you go to like a cool enough or good enough club, you can definitely trust the selections and the DJ bookings to be good on any given weekend. Or even if it's not someone that you know, it's definitely something that you kind of be a big fan of. And I remember... um going there a lot and of course Grease Mule was definitely one of the places that I visited and kind of been blown away by in terms of just a club it's just a really nice space um it was probably the best place to sorry probably the best space to roll on especially outside on the swings I remember one time years ago sitting outside on a couch and just holding this lady's hand as we were kind of rolling nothing happened nothing crazy just holding hands just kind of talking crazy for hours and hours and hours and hours until we basically left until right at the end no and the, and the thing i love about i think when i go there a lot, there's never an exchanging of numbers there's never usually instagram stops it's just stuff that exists in the moment which is why usually when i go there i rarely if ever post pictures and stuff i just kind of want to you know immerse myself in the environment and i remember being a greaseman and thinking wow man this is definitely one of those things because taking a picture of grease Miller when you're in the swings or you're in the little climbing frame thing it doesn't necessarily resonate when you see it the next day back because it's pretty ratty looking it looks a little bit you know diy-ish it probably is it's like it's been stuck together with duct tape and whatnot but when you're there it seems so fun you're exploring all these different avenues you're jumping up these monkey bars you're pretending to do pull-ups you're hiding in little spots and stuff you're sitting here you're sitting there you're chilling with this person you're chilling with that person it's such a cool little hang that it never really gets reflected well in the flipping pictures. But anyway, that aside, Cocteau de More definitely one of the most favorite nights I've been to. And funnily enough, I kind of discovered Cocteau de More based on a review written by um, Daniel Wang for Electronic Beats back in the day when Electronic Beats was actually sick. Now it's not so much. Now it's kind of fallen by the wayside. But Electronic Beats used to have these really cool article they'd write um, about the Berlin scene and whatnot and about other people associated with the electronic music scene in general, focusing on artists and interviews and whatnot and loads of really cool op-eds. And Daniel Wang put together a real good kind of ode and love letter to flipping um, Cocteau de Moore that I absolutely fell in love with. And I think one of the bits that kind of resonates that I kind of read that to you towards the end kind of gives you a really good description, idea of what the kind of place is like. It's got some cool pictures the people that attended it but essentially if you scroll down here towards the end it will say here da, da, da. yeah um yes that's it i love the way the music flows at cocktail without too much drama and personal statement leaving so much oral space up for the bodies of the dancer to do what they will that sounds like alistair mccrawley pagan rituals worshiping the beast all of that no gospel choirs no gimmicky digital noises but rather a continuous stream of rhythm and bass and this is no accident because disco drama duo plays so much from physical instinct that their fingers always are under pitch control never too fast or too slow thus the clock stands still and thus the day remains night and no one ever notices too much expression can end up turning into a chaotic soup simplicity and oral and visual stimuli are an underrated virtue one which is always respected here I stay on the dance floor for cocktail, simply floating on these rhythms and this soft emotion and stop wondering or worrying when it's ever supposed to end. It doesn't end. So here is a love letter to my favorite cocktail. Grazie, regassi, Sinchi, Prost, Campai. Let's dance and enjoy the music. E tutto, e tutta quella genti fiori de testa. Daniel Wang, May 2014. And that for me was all I needed to hear. Don't get me wrong, the party obviously isn't for me. It's primarily a party centered around um, gay culture and LGBTQ and queer people and whatnot. And it's definitely something that I would describe as more so of a safe space for them as opposed to me being a hetero cisgendered male. But still, I feel like going to cocktail was such a eye-opener, was so refreshing because I was so used to 
the kind of you know the oot oot dark side of techno everyone went black and bondage everywhere which is obviously fun to see and hang out with but i'm from london and i'm from the place of the multi-genre dj which is a really lame and horrible term but essentially djs that don't have one genre they stick to they play everything based on you know what time of night or what the vibe is like so to go to somewhere like a berlin and just be hearing techno from you know morning till night was a little bit tiring so after a while to kind of freshen things up again i you know randomly went to flipping grease miller again i didn't know nothing about cocktail i kind of read that one article and then randomly i kind of popped into grease miller and cocktails on that night and it was an absolute joy to hear cheesy pop music to hear really good disco really good synth pop really good you know ebm um, really good punk music that really strange and eclectic and varied kind of soundscape that if anything was more representative of what Berghain is and what it used to be then maybe the straight up you know knacked corny nonsense big platform boots and bondage shit going on at the moment that's a little bit formulaic and a little bit boring i like the kind of mix up a bit a little bit of fresh don't get me wrong no one's going to flip in berlin to go to the best ama piano night there probably is some there you know you go to places based on their kind of strong suit but for the most part i do think it's a quite a nice balance to have these two things going on the same place a place where there's kind of crazy black techno industrial dark sounds and then you've also got this really nice light environment where everybody's kind of encouraged to get silly let their hair down not take so too seriously have a drink have a laugh and whatnot and i really like the vibe and if anything there's a really cool little article here from electronic beats actually that features some of the last pictures ever taken at grease miller before it closed because now i think grease miller if i'm not mistaken is now rso club if i'm not mistaken it's now rso so grease miller now is changed to rso it's a different venue different location um different build everything about it um but now they're doing the cocktails at this other place called club ost i haven't been to which again is another good thing because when i go it's gonna mean i'm gonna go on a little nighttime you know non-cruising kind of cruising jaunt and i'm gonna be able to kind of club hop and go to different spaces and check them out but i thought these pictures taken from electronic beats um featuring the last ever grease muller so the last ever cocktail the more grease muller were pretty cool and they give you a little bit of a kind of uh, an idea on the vibe this was on the right here is a picture showing the main sort of dance floor that i remember if i remember correctly there was a the, on this wall here towards the right there's these really nice big open windows that are all different sizes and kind of a little bit habit you know happily put together and they're kind of covered in nice little clear sheets of different color so when the light is kind of seeping through it kind of shines different lights through it's really cool really nice i think that may be where fold might have got the idea for their club shuttle windows things maybe the guys went to fold saw grease miller because i remember when i saw group fold for the first time and decided having those little show those shutters it kind of reminded me a little bit of panorama bar in the morning when they kind of raise the blinds up and also kind of reminded me a little bit of um of Grace Smuller and that little thing they got there on the side and obviously Cocktail I think Club Division they also have the same sort of thing but I remember that being one of the best things about it and the DJ Biff is really up close it's on the same level as the dance floor it's right in front of you no one really pay attention to it too much because there's so much going on in the main room over together but I loved it and I think towards the side of here where there's the windows anyway where I'm looking at there's also a, be a row of chairs if I'm not mistaken I think it was chairs or tables or something along those kind of lines so that was always pretty cool to check out um, and again all these little fun things outside which are really cool um you got these really i don't know if they're water tanks or something or oil drums or something these really tall cylinder little things that you can kind of sit in on that are really cool especially if it wasn't cold or wet you had a really big swing you had a yeah loads of pallets and stuff that you could sit on there was a darkish type of room that you could sit in as well and chill um great sound system again cool outside to hang out even during the summer lighting bar the toilets i remember greatly oh this is the best bit in the year next to the river was you come out next as you come out of the club and you pass where all the kind of you know the adult adventure park is the basically um grease mill is on the is on basically a river kind of similar to what you see to in hackney wick and whatnot and there's this really nice decking that you can sit down on and if anything if i'm not mistaken there's decking all over the place so there's little deckings bits like inside a little forest so you can find little nooks and crannies and chill sometimes you're walking there you might pop by and see somebody people doing some you know some funky stuff and whatnot but it's just a cool place to hang out on and kind of watch the sunrise as you're rolling um and again more cool pictures of the inside with bottles and beers all over the place and yeah this brings back some money memories man and i remember this place so this is the entrance as you come in i remember one time specifically going there 
Um, I don't think it was a cup. It wasn't a cocktail de more. It was something else. And I do remember a, one of our group of people just not e- accurately put in. Because I guess Berlin's weird. Because I guess you, you're, you're encouraged to take drugs inside the bathrooms. You're obviously not meant to do them on the dance floor and kind of disrespect the space. And obviously risk, you know, the space getting shut down because you're not obeying the rules and whatnot, being too flagrant what you're doing. And I think maybe that also extends to the security and the searches outside. I think they they don't expect you to flipping, you know, stuff stuff up your flipping rectum. But I think they do kind of hope that you put some effort to conceal what you're doing. And I guess the guy that was with, he just had it in his pocket. Like, just had it in his like pocket. Like, he had coins in there and maybe forgot. And I remember it being so funny because we all got in and he was the last one in. And I think he, as you were waiting for him to get in, they found the thing. Uh, I think he had some coke and a little baggie. And the guy basically just literally looked at it, opened it really slowly, and simply poured the whole context out in the bin. And he said to him, what do you want to do? Do you want to go in or do you want to leave? He said, yeah, I'll go in. So yeah, cool. And he paid and he went in. Like he poured the entire bag in. I think it might have been whether he picked up a gram, two grams, three and a half, who knows. He poured the entire baggie. Like he just looked at him, opened it up. He just, yeah, he sort of patted him down, saw the baggie pulled it open slowly and just slowly poured it into the bin next to him because i think there was a bin next to the bouncers when they're searching and stuff so they can get rid of any bottles or whatnot stuff you have um but i remember that being a <laughs> being a really funny part of my uh Grishman story and also the walk down so this is the there's like a picture here that shows an alleyway on the side of a big warehouse where basically i guess Grishman was on the corner and you basically walk down here to go on a way to go there which kind of reminds me a little bit of like um color factory color factory has a little section at the back where you kind of can sit down and see the trees a little bit it kind of reminds me a little bit of that but i do remember this be this is usually the location where i'd be stuffing my stuff in my socks or whatever or boarding whatever gear i had on me when you take this long walk down that's usually the location that you do all your stuff in so seeing the pictures brings back a lot of good memories and it's unfortunate it had to close i think they had to do it's probably redevelopment, you know, another part of gentrification. I'm sure they're going to turn that whole place into some big, shiny, you know, buildings and whatnot. Um, everyone that's going to live there now going forward will have no recollection or no memory, no memory of Greece Miller. Probably won't care about the space at all. And it'll be kind of lost in the annals of time. But it was an amazing space. Really, really was an amazing space. One of the most fun clubs I've been to, 100%. And I honestly... Um, can't wait to i guess i can't wait to go at spirit home because it's not the same place but you know i wish it was still around and stuff but it's good that there is some picture or evidence of it still existing out there that we can kind of get a look at because obviously most of these places it's no pictures no videos and whatnot so if you do get some idea on the pictures and stuff we can look back on it is quite a nice thing to go back and look at but still as i mentioned before club ost um costa del mar 25th of february um obviously as you can see there for some reason cocktail del mar still do things um really low-key there's no r there's no resident advisor the event there's no sorry there's no ra tickets there's no dice tickets it's all on their own platform they're doing it they've got the event list up on facebook they've got some tickets on some other ticketing website that i'm not really too familiar with i love that ab- ability about it i think they've got a telegram group that you can join and some other bits and bobs if you want to get involved but for the most part it's kind of like if you know you know but i definitely would say it's one of my favorite parties to go to and i went there a very long time ago it's not even made for me it's made i mean it's not even made with me in mind at all but i still had an absolute blast and i enjoyed it and if anything it kind of added to the overall love affair that i've had with that fucking city forever and ever anyway so moving on from that one let's talk about or oh it's about this yeah i have to talk about it so news courtesy of mix mag again pick up mix mag for providing me with all the news on a timely basis i do enjoy your coverage very very much they said the following regarding the o2 academy brixton will remain closed until april following the fatal crowd crush as you know that sake concert that happened um a few weeks ago unfortunately two people passed away one person was a security guard and one person was a mom of two who unfortunately passed away due to the crash and people going and trying to attend the party without any tickets which led to really crazy amounts of overflow flow outside and people trying to rush the doors and whatnot to the point where the concert had to get cancelled and now of course in regular kind of london fashion when it comes to these sort of tragedies the license of o2 academy brixton are suspended and now they're saying they're going to be closed until april going forward now for me 
The only thing I would say, even though I don't like these suspension things that happen all the time, whenever there's a tragedy in a club and there's the only reaction, the only response to kind of dealing with it is to usually suspend the license, remove licenses, or basically shut the club down or basically put them in the corner where they have to shut down. I don't like that being the only reaction. I, I'm interested to see what happens in the, with a venue that's owned by, like what they're owned by. I think it's AMG or Live Nation, whatever it may be. I'm interested to see if the rules are different with these sort of venues because we've already seen what's happened at, what you call it? Is it Pickle Factory or Oval Space or whatever it may be? Um, we saw what happened there. We've seen what's happening with that nightclub in Birmingham where that lad unfortunately got stabbed and killed on the dance floor. We see what happens with regular nightclubs when stuff happens that was, is outside of their control. If somebody wants to come into a nightclub with a weapon and they're helping on hit, hurting somebody, they're going to come in with a weapon. No amount of security checks unless you're flipping, scanning people in like they're at the airport, is going to you know not get somebody in there with a weapon to do some bodily harm. But I'm interested to see, would they close down or would they remove the license of O2 Bricks like they did that venue in Birmingham and like I did with the space here in Bethnal Green, I'm not sure if it's Oval or whatever it may be, to the point where now that space is having to change and they're turning into a flipping studio, you know those white wall studios where they host, you know, weddings and cocktail making clubs and shit, like that's what it's basically turning into. So if that doesn't happen, we know the conspiracy is deep and that these kind of, you know, Live Nation, AMG tentacles run really long because usually in any kind of event, if this was happening in any other place, God forbid any other flipping venue in London, the license would be reviewed, moved and it wouldn't be back again anytime soon. So let's see what happens with this one. But if we continue the article, it says, Brixton's Auto Academy will remain shuttered for the next three months following a fatal crowd crash in December, according to The Guardian. The venue will remain closed until April. Owners of Academy Group um, AMG confirmed on Saturday while investigators are still ongoing so it's not it's partly a decision of them and the police until april Brixton's academy license was temporarily suspended until today january 16th lambeth council licensing community will meet today to discuss the ongoing matter okay cool so basically they're going to extend it until april after today's meeting um amg said in a statement to bbc that it had reflected deeply on the incident and will close regardless of the license review decision made today on the 7th 15th a crush occurred um, both in the foyer and outside the venue during a concert for Afro pop singer Ashake was performing. Rebecca Ukomelo, 33, and Gabby Hutchinson, 23, passed away just days later on December 17th and 19th, respectively, while the third person remains hopeless in critical condition. Still, Jesus Christus. It's currently understood that the venue will remain closed until April. Per the subcommittee's meeting later today, several investigations continue, led by the Med Police, who said that it would call for the venue's continued license suspension today during the meeting. So let's see what happens. Let's see what happens going forward but they should have their license removed forever if you see what happens to other clubs here in the uk or in london specifically but you know we know how things are a bit corrupt and a bit dodgy so i'm going to keep an eye on that one and see how that develops going forward and see how that develops going forward next we've got to talk about this story as well courtesy of mix mag focusing on a brussels club called fuse that could be due to close due to noise complaints we know that well to you know we know that story here in London. This has basically been the bane of most of London, you know, nightclub history in terms of local councils or newly minted, newly um, moved in people complaining about the, you know, the clubs that were already there before they moved in and basically get to a point where they file enough complaints where the club gets shut down and whole communities and little scenes are splintered and destroyed off the back of it. It's really annoying. It's probably the most annoying part of gentrification for me because I do feel like gentrification does sometimes can have positives i've seen it in kind of the parts of london that i'm from you know parts of like canning town custom house stratford i've seen the good parts of it but i've also seen parts where they essentially displace people who have already established roots in their location there's no real um what's that word called there's no real um cons there's no real consultation there's no real meetings and you know middle grounds to be reached to kind of make it work for both parties is always whoever's got the most money if they complain enough they get what they want basically which is always annoying so it looks like the same thing happening in brussels it says here brussels venue folds could be forced to close permanently due to noise complaints the 29 year old club jesus christ imagine noise complaints you know um one of belgium's oldest and most beloved will shut temporarily as of today while it awaits the results of an appeal after almost 29 years of existence fuse has received um from brussels regional administration the immediate order to play music at a maximum of 95 decibels and to close the doors at 2 a.m which is ridiculous 
ridiculous. We used a statement from a few social media posts on Thursday. Um, Fuse few added that it would make it impossible for the venue to continue to open. The club will remain closed from today. They stated, there's obviously got the post here, Fuse has to close. And it continues here. According to the club, Fuse had back and forth with the neighbor over the course of um, several years and made efforts to improve the venue soundproofing through significant isolated works. Despite efforts to compromise, the problem remained. And this is always the case. It's always one or two or three. It's never like a whole horde of people complaining. That's our only issue about it. And for whatever reason, councils, the world over are set up in a way where one person's complaint can shake and move things to the point where clubs legitimately have to close down. It's really weird how that happens. It doesn't happen I don't think in any other sector, I don't think in the world, actually, any other industry, any other part of life where one or two people can affect change in that way. Maybe counterculture has something to do with that. Maybe... You know, the early days of counterculture, if people make up enough fuss on social media, you you know, some people could lose jobs and opportunities. But again, I don't think that's one or two people. That's usually a small amount of people who are annoyed by it, but it's definitely enough people to cause a stink. But whatever it's to do with noise complaints, it's always one or two or one neighbor in particular who doesn't want to compromise, who's just fed up. Like, And the thing I understand on both sides, I just say if you're a neighbor, I've listened to people talk about the damages and the flipping you know how horrendous it was because i remember when i was kind of fighting and kind of really rallying against the whole um, licensing revoking of that was big license revoking that was happening in parts of east london in particular like shoreditch dawson and whatnot and parts of hackney where loads of clubs that we all know and love basically had to shut down because a lot of their licenses were being revoked or they weren't being able to open for late enough times you know loads of nonsense happened and i remember the time being really against anybody that was kind of you know kicking back and sort of pushing back and pushing for these places to be closed because of course i love these clubs but then when you actually listen to people who live in a local area and you hear what they say in particular one dude who was talking about how he'd wake up most weekends taking his daughters to the park or taking his dog to a walk and having to like avoid pieces you know st you know piles sorry uh, piles of shit uh poor piss pud piss puddles um loads of drug paraphernalia needles condoms people's vomit all over the place and this and because he lived like in a flat kind of masonette sort of area you'd imagine if it's late at night and people don't want to go to the you know don't want to wait and piss at the club or the clubs are closed the first place they're going to piss at is a little kind of enclave little door bit that looks kind of hidden but of course in the morning the people that live in that building have to kind of open that door and be you know uh flipping woken up by the gust of your urine smell or your shit smell whatever it may be so i could definitely understand it from that side of things but again why can't we meet why can't we have a consultation why can't we have some sort of um something some compromise that can make it work for both sides it's not just the fact of just closing spaces especially if you move there after the fact you have no to little right to be closing spaces like that but for whatever reason councils always prioritize the residents of these places the post of business that are bringing actual money to the local areas with anyway Fuse introduced an appeal against a decision at the whatever that place is, the environment, and a decision expected by January the 25th, the club confirmed. Following the news of the club's temporary closure, a petition has also been launched to save the venues attempting to meet the 25,000 signatures. I'll put, I'll let me put it up on the screen so you guys can see the change the org petition. It's assigned a petition to support the Fuse Club in Brussels, Belgium. I'll be signing this after I finished uh, recording the podcast. So definitely, if you haven't seen it before, definitely sign it. I'll put the link in the show notes as well for you to check it out. Um, it continues here. It's very regrettable that an iconic club gathering thousands of music lovers and artists employing 10 people during the week and 80 people during a weekend is put at stake because of one neighbor. Jesus Christ, one person, one person is doing all this. It's going to put in jeopardy a 20, was it 28 year? How long has that club been around? 29 years, nearly 30 year club is going to be nearly, sh might be shut down if one person gets their way. Absolutely heen the sun. Open night 94, Fuse has become one of Belgium's most celebrated nightlife spots uh, built in the home of the former cinema. It is clear that the closing of Fuse Club and parties is host is also has an impact on the local economy, foreign tourism and Brussels cultural life. We call on, a we call on the competent regional authority to reverse the decision. Hopefully it does get reversed, really does. I'm really do praying for them. Um, hopefully they have a far better appeals, you know, um, process than we do here in london because it feels like whenever a club is at risk of losing their license unless you're fabric um you definitely lose it so hopefully that changes but god almighty man that one neighbor is absolutely causing hell in it all types of bloody hell all types of bloody hell next moving on 
Let's talk about this quickly. So I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts lately the other day. One of my favorite love to hate podcasts because Chris Black, one of the co-hosts of How Long Gone, is one of the most insufferable people I've ever had the pleasure of kind of uh, crossing paths with on the interwebs. He's definitely somebody that kind of will grind your gears and annoy you and definitely remind you of all the excessively trying to call to be cool guys from your local scene, the people who are, you know, clearly over the hill but still trying to remain somewhat relevant the people have some of the worst hot takes in the world but again it's compelling viewing i think that's what you need in most podcasts but if it's a duo you need somebody that most of the fans like who is um what's his name um dem jeans jason you need someone like him and you also you need someone like chris black who's basically somebody that a lot of people love to hate for it to be a really good compelling podcast and of course the other thing also is that they have great guests they really go out of their way to get really great guests they do a bit of a cheat thing with their guests as well where they get a lot of people as guests who are prominent media figures or personalities within their little scenes whether they're writers scenesters sub stackers and stuff and you know on top of artists they also get um, i have to really recommend one of the best interviews they've got on here which is really surprising as an interview with Fabio Foreign. Yes, I like I kid you not, Fabio Foreign might have one of the better interviews he's ever had um on How Long Gone. It probably helped that they're two kind of dorky white guys in his eyes. And of course in their eyes he's this exotic black man who comes from a dangerous part of town. So definitely it was a really cool kind of uh, balance to kind of hear them speak. So I definitely recommend you check that out if you haven't already. How long gone definitely one of my favorite podcasts. And they had an interview recently with Sophia Prantera who is the founder co-founder i guess of, of um, uh, aries and she had a really good interview talking about the kind of you know uh, the start of the brand and what they're doing or whatnot and one thing that was really interesting as she was talking was that number one aries is due to open a store in soho very soon which is really interesting because i don't know part of me thinks you know it makes sense because the brand is growing and i think clearly a brand like aries probably needs to have a store to tell their overall story so you can maybe be immersed into their world and kind of get an idea of their inspirations and their visions and their vibes and their whatever it may be cool but the other side of things i don't necessarily think they sell enough product to justify having an actual store from my inkling of just looking from the outside looking in the other thing that I really kind of didn't really understand with the Aries in general, I think she mentioned it a bit in the interview, um, Sophia Pantera, she was like, oh, um, she hires a lot of her sons or, you know, son's friends to kind of model people associated within that group. And I think he's, her son is like 19 or something. So I guess anyone between the ages of like 18 and 25 gets to model the Aries. And I've always wondered why they do that, considering how expensive the items are. Like, why do they persist with having really young looking guys and kids wear their garments? Kind of reminded me a little bit of like when um, Alessandro Michele was at Gucci. I've, I feel like a lot of the, maybe the Gucci clothes were really, kind of um how do you call them they're really whimsical and really kitschy looking so those kind of clothes immediately no matter what your age they're always going to kind of age you they're always going to make you look 20 years older just because of how kind of grown up and kitschy and off kilter they look but i feel like when it comes to aries the clothes quality or look of it never really matches the price and i'm looking at here right looking at this kind of you know this aussie jean jacket and aussie lily jean pants the jacket is 425 the pants are 295 all over print featuring what pieces of newspaper um you know sweatshirts for 295 hats for 55 it never really made any sense cardigans for 250 to have the kids wearing this stuff that generally i don't think look like they could afford it or maybe they could if they have kind of rich parents and then also having it at such a high price point it would make more sense to maybe have our older clientele modeling your clothes so that it would maybe i don't know look a better maybe kind of be a little bit more congruent to the price ranging maybe but maybe that's the whole point maybe when you have a brand you're meant to make people kind of wonder lust so you may be meant to make them kind of desire to be young again when they see these really rosy cheeked um bushy tailed you know bright-eyed kids modeling the clothes it maybe makes them think of uh you know the times and they when they were young and doing cool and interesting things but i don't know i feel like they probably need a little bit of a shift there and again especially if they go to open the retail store it'll be really interesting to see them and how they interpret it or it'll be interesting to see who actually goes to the store from just a point of view me it'll be interesting to see who's actually there on a daily basis um, shopping and buying this stuff because I don't necessarily see this out and about too tough. And when I do see Aries out and about, 
the most thing I see people wearing is a no problemo shirt, no problemo sweatshirt, no problemo t-shirt and cap and stuff, which is, you know, a little bit lame and a little bit corny to wear, but still that's done real wonders for their brand going forward. And I don't know, I just don't feel like there is a lot of kind of link there, but let's just see what happens when they do develop and do end up going forward with it. Um, one thing that I did really like about Aries, I think is definitely an underrated hit. Um, maybe I'm hoping it sold a lot for them and did well. Is this collaboration they did with um, how do you pronounce that? Zuzu. Um, it's a, a X O U X O U, and they did this phone case that is really cool looking. Especially considering that I'm going to get an upgrade on my iPhone very soon. I'm definitely got my eye on this kind of phone case they've got. And if you're not watching it, it's essentially a phone case that is um, constructed around a piece of rope, a carbiner, and a fake kind of like cuban link chain i guess looking wise reading from the description it says as follows aries and xou xou um snake print iphone case with a durable recyclable plastic shell soft smooth to the touch with gold aries temple onto the front um comes with a gold carabiner chunky gold chain and rope that can be easily combined to customize different lengths designed to be worn multiple ways and if you've seen the pictures or i'm just going to describe it to you essentially you're able to wear your phone like a bag like a side pouch which is pretty cool you can wear it like a necklace around your neck if you need be or whatever it may be uh, the chain i probably wouldn't wear because it's definitely going to turn my my neck green but I do like the one picture where I think the girl's got the chain kind of hanging off. Yeah, this one. This is probably the picture, the way that I'd probably go with when I wear mine. She's basically got the carbine and the rope um, on either end of the phone and the chain hanging off of it. So you can basically have it, you know, kind of like strapped across you, which is quite nice. Especially when you consider, you know, if you're able, if you're going to get a phone like I am, which is an iPhone well, I'm getting like a 14 Pro Max or something. And those things are massive. So, you know, maybe the jeans I wear might be a little bit too big and whatnot. Or maybe stuff like this is pretty cool too. You can have it like a little bit of a side um, wallet chain looking type of vibe. But I do like this kind of side pouch thing going on. But again, this has probably been the most interesting thing that I've seen them done. I've seen them do. Definitely something that kind of caught my eye and kind of piqued my interest. But, you know, it's a collaboration. It's probably something that they probably didn't spend that much time doing. I'm not sure how much of it is selling considering the price range. I think it's like 95, 100 quid. Not sure people are spending 100 quid on a phone case. Um, maybe you can clowner it if you want. But yeah, I'm a big fan. Oh, it's 98 actually, not even 95. It's 98. How much is the same price for all the ranges? Yeah, it's cool. So if I wanted to get that, that would be sold in that way. So I'm a big fan of that. But I don't know. It was just to hear her talk about the brand and its future and stuff and like i said i'm really curious to see what they do with this store because i don't know from being in london and being around i don't feel like i see a lot of aries around town anymore i feel like when i did see it often i'll see a lot of people that i would consider to be influencers people that i would consider to be quote unquote cool who probably maybe got it seeded who maybe got it at a discount maybe bought it at you know whatever else maybe little deals here and there but i didn't really see a lot of actual punters going in and buying full head to toe aries looks despite some of their stuff being really good but i just feel like it's in a weird position because is it street is it kind of elevated streetwear is it really an elevated like in some regards, I look at Aries and I think to myself, is it just like a really, like, is it like the Central St. Martins version of Sporty and Rich? Or is, you know, or is it um, the flipping second reincarnation of Adam Kemmel or something? Do you know what I mean? Like, what is it? Is it a legit runway brand? Or is it kind of a brand that's kind of doing cut and sew and streetwear? I'm not really too sure because a lot of the stuff is kind of all over the place in terms of what they put out there. Like this top here that we're looking at on screen, it's a No Problemo sweatshirt. It looks like the No Problemo has been bedazzled or embroidered, I'm not really too sure. But the jumper, you know, shape itself is really well done. Like clearly this is not a, you know, stock piece. This is something that definitely kind of cut and sewed and built for themselves in their own pattern. It's got a nice little um, ruffle type, not ruffle, what do you call that? Um, it's got a little pinch on the shoulder here so it makes the shoulders look a bit exaggerated the body's a bit shorter um, the waistband here looks a little bit more thicker that they had to kind of get that specially done obviously the tie dye print is really impressive but the shape of the sweatshirt is really nice and really well put but is that sweatshirt you know should it be valued and priced at 495 500 however it's gonna be i'm not really too sure it's something that you i mean and then you scroll down and then you see all the kind of merchy aries no problemo stuff and it kind of immediately cheapens whatever you see up there above so maybe the messaging is just a bit all over the place for me um and then you see stuff like this like this 
like I'm scrolling down is this really amazing tracksuit look with a I think it's basically like a it looks like a a down tracksuit essentially you've got if it looks like they're like a vest on top of a bomber jacket a vest on top of a jacket and then you've got some pants that go with it and you've got their kind of what you'd call their codes of Aries, which is always this kind of tie-dye acid wash type of print thing going on there which is always pretty cool um this is perfectly definitely my favorite bit that they've got here these jeans these combats that are kind of over uh, is it called is it called over dye i'm not sure what that process is called but it looks really really nice these kind of remind me a lot of those kind of hot girl ig combats a lot of the you know girls online be wearing with their heels and whatnot but i like the shape of those and the denim shoot is always really nice with the hood on it so yeah it's a bit all over the place for me personally so i'm interested to see what happens and that's a fucking sick look there um with the aries bomber and a mohair jumper it looks like and some nice i don't know if they're camo trousers or whatnot but they're really cool looking but i'm interested to see what happens going forward with their store um of course they probably need the store like i said to tell their overall story well maybe have some bits and pieces there like merch like music um magazines loads of other paraphernalia furniture um even the smell whatever all that stuff will be interested to see going forward and how it evolves and kind of progresses but i don't know i feel like it's all over the place i see so many different inspirations with different pieces and you see the merch stuff it feels a little bit lame it feels a little bit whatever but hopefully it kind of progresses but it was nice to hear us speak about the brand you don't really hear these people speak too often about what they do so that was pretty cool to check out so definitely haven't checked out before please do how long gone episode number 422 featuring oh no it's not 422 it must be higher than that i think they numbered it wrong it should be episode number 444 featuring yeah no sorry it should be episode number 442 not 422 for episode number 422 but it's actually this is 422 that should be should be number 442 Featuring Sophia Pantera, um, one and a half of, or I guess she's the main founder. I'm not sure if uh, Galicia's is still involved. I'm not sure what the deal is there, but definitely check it out if you haven't already. Give you some insight on Aries. And then, moving on from that, we wanted to talk about this before I leave ya. This really, really good interview with um, ASAP Bari on our, well, our generation music. OGM, which I really follow online a lot. I really like what they do. Um, I follow them mostly so I can know which albums are coming up because there's so many Lils and so many young rappers popping up all over the place. It's hard to keep a, a touch and breath of who's, who's happening and who's popping all over the place. And since No Jump has kind of fallen off in terms of interviewing the young up and coming rap stars and whatnot. I feel like all of my attention is being kind of shifted towards OGM and their interviews. And of course, some people, they highlight on Instagram pages and they have this little post that they usually upload around Friday or whenever albums release, where they kind of put all the list of albums and projects dropping and also singles. So you can basically go down the entire thing and check them out. They may even have a Spotify. I'm not too sure that kind of collates it all together, but it's a really good way to kind of keep on top of the new music happening. So if you're kind of a little bit like me and a little bit all over the place, so you don't really know what's going on, but you want to also be, plugged in and in tune to find out who the next yeet is i definitely recommend you check out generation music but they sat down with asap bari who is one of the founding members of asap mob of course with asap rocky and ferg and obviously rip asap yams and somebody who was really influential in kind of you know pushing forward this high fashion loving that people in hip-hop seems to have nowadays and um yeah his story is really interesting but i'm not gonna lie that's a really good interview one hour and 30 minutes of it i feel like it's maybe hakeem's best interview also i feel like you know it, it's you can tell the difference with somebody when they're interviewing someone they clearly admire or look up to or are fans of because the, the conversation felt like it was really flowing naturally nothing felt forced but also felt like he did his homework and research and got the questions that didn't need to be asked that you know the fans and people like myself and the kind of viewers on the outside were interested in kind of finding out um it would have been nice to maybe hear some of the other bits and pieces considering you know the drama around him and rocky maybe maybe some bits and pieces about why him and tremaine fell out because i thought they had a pretty cool and dope friendship going on then it's quite sad to see them fall out maybe what's happened with ian connor so far but apart from that i thought it was a really cool insight to kind of find out more about bari one thing i was really interested to find out about him was his story regarding tiana taylor and how influential she was with everything 
um, in terms of the kind of origins of ASAP Mob, in that she kind of was the link between a lot of people because you know they kind of knew each other from the same scene in Harlem. And it's funny because when I think back to my time growing up on the internet, I was also very aware of who Tiana Taylor was from where well, like, I am here in London, from her just being the kind of it girl type of vibe, socialite, popular person online in my space. So back in the day, my face, I remember. Even, I remember even speaking to her. I think a couple of times on DMs and stuff about music and stuff she was dropping, or just about being cool and clothes and whatnot. Because there wasn't a lot of people out there that were really plugged in in the way that kind of we were back then. So it was really cool to kind of hear him speak about that. Um, one other thing I think it was funny hearing him talk about, oh, which I kind of resonated with. I think um, Hakeem mugs him about Pharrell. No, I think about Lil Wayne, about if he ever got like a style inspiration from him and stuff. And he kind of smirked and said, nah, because he was obviously looking at us. And, you know, we were kind of looking at the OGs, at the, you know, Hiroshis and Negos and whatnot. And it was the same for me coming up. There was a time when I was coming up, um, when I was kind of obsessed with Bape, um, when I was obsessed with all those Japanese brands like Fragment and whatnot and Visvim and stuff, when at the same time, Pharrell was also kind of having a relationship with Nigo and kind of launching being a boys club and doing his thing there. And he was kind of getting into that sort of stuff. And it was funny because I was clearly into that stuff way before Pharrell even knew who Nigo was. But obviously, because he's the fucking big megastar and whatnot, it looks like when you're wearing the stuff to the regular normie person out there, it looks like you're copying Pharrell. When in fact, it felt like he was kind of copying our little scene that we were all kind of plugged in on. So if anything, a lot of us, I remember myself in particular, going out of our way to not wear whatever Pharrell had in terms of Bape stuff because it would look like you're copying him. So if he had a particular jacket, a particular hoodie he was wearing, you wouldn't pour it. Like I think of my green camo hoodie that I flipping loved. You know, when he started wearing it a lot, I had to kind of ice mine out and kind of put it to the side because I didn't want to be baiting it up too much. Um, when he started wearing the shock too much, he started to put that to the side. You know what I mean? All those little things happened. So it was less so about looking at Pharrell and more so about looking at Nigo, the guy actually behind the brand, the one who was kind of instrumental in kind of launching and helping Pharrell kind of launch building their boys club and do all that cool stuff going forward so that's funny to hear him say that and then of course the more interesting part of it was definitely towards the end where he touches upon um the importance of, of virgil and what he kind of meant to him what he kind of meant to the culture of rule going forward and i thought it's a really touching you know obviously observation from him, him being such a close friend to virgil and i think it's a really I, i'm I, you know as much as it's sad that he's passed and of course the way he did pass and considering how much more he had to do and how much more how much he did in such a short space of time and the amount of people he's kind of left behind kind of reeling and upset that they maybe didn't spend enough time with him during the last times or the last months that he was kind of alive to kind of really kind of let him know how he much he impacted them and whatnot and blah 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 one of the things that's really kind of comforting about his time is that he clearly touched people like in a really deep way like because i you know i've been around the scene I've been around a lot of these people. I've been around a lot of these people that know these people and stuff. And I know how a lot of those people are. They're really selfish, really callous. They're really self-absorbed. Um, they don't really, you know, every relationship is kind of dependent on what you could do for them, uh, that kind of vibe. So for them to really kind of pour the love out there and let it be known that no Virgil was special he was one of a kind it lets you know that that guy really was special and one of a kind behind the scenes because these people don't be giving out flowers too often they don't be giving out loves and props like that they don't be kind of kissing the ring or you know or kind of bowing to greatness and whatnot or really giving it up in that way because everybody kind of feels like they're the star themselves right they're the kind of star of their they're the kind of hero in their own movie everyone's kind of got these kind of delusions of grandeur myself included of where they should be what they should be doing so there's a lot a lot of kind of praise and um congratulatory praise and just reverence going around so the fact that they do this is clearly an I, clearly an example of how much of how great of a guy that dude was and also what i like about it is that the level that he was operating at being the head of louis vuitton men's running off white uh, collaborations coming out of his ass super successful super clouded up you know viral all this sort of stuff that everybody loves and wants has a respect of the industry had a respect of people on the scene underground overground doing all that good stuff plugged in it was cool and it's i think it's great that he set such an example of being such so cool and so approachable and willing to like sign people's stuff and answer dms and leave comments and double tap comments and stuff and just engage and kind of bring himself down to the level of the regular customer and the regular fan because a lot of those guys are really up their own ass and kind of think their shit don't stink and they're always talking about you know 
uh, paying dues and kissing rings and, you know, this nonsense to kind of make themselves feel important, even though they're nobodies. And the fact that somebody like a Virgil, who's a clearly a somebody in the highest sense of the word, was able to be so humane and so approachable, so open, whatever, definitely goes to, goes a long way for him. And definitely, I felt like sets an example where some people who are working as a middle management of some sneaker brand can't start flexing if the person actually designed the shoes that got you the job in the first place was so cool and chill and approachable you can't then be a prick and be up here on ass. so i definitely feel like that's a good thing that you kind of left behind but anyway enough of me rambling this is asap Bari talking about you know the impact virgil had on his life and whatnot Verge, man. Verge is one of, like, he, I felt like he was an angel sent from heaven. Like, you feel me? Mm -hmm. Like, Verge was, like, you see how Tupac, what, what age did Tupac die? 20 something, right? It had to be 20 something. Well, like 23 or some shit like that, or 26. Let's see. Look, how old was Tupac? 25. 25, bro. Mm -hmm. Tupac is a legend at 25. Virgil died at what age? 30-something, right? Imagine the shit that Virgil would have did if he was alive right now. I know, bro. It's, okay, it's, it's actually like... So that lets you know that angels are real. Virgil is an angel. He got... Virgil was killing shit. I met with this... I'm not going to say nobody's name. I met with this... Um, a designer, he designs furniture. And I asked him, why didn't he work with Virgil? And he said that Virgil was doing too many collaborations. And that at the time, he didn't see that Virgil was sick. And I was, it doesn't matter about that. It doesn't matter if this person, Virgil was going Americani Next thing, fucking Nike, um, the hardest fucking shoes. Fucking Moet. Like, fuck the, the, the just designing sneakers. Like, he was going Gagosian paintings. Like, you feel me? Mercedes like, Verge was moving like fucking flash on these niggas to the point where they couldn't catch up. He's and it was laps, just like, yeah. it's, that's the life Pac was living. Pac was living like, yo, we gotta get this shit done. You feel me? What do you so? What do you feel like se separated him from everyone else? His childhood of His just see, of just seeing things, being around Kanye, having the inspiration of fucking Pharrell and Nigo and Verge knew shit that I knew. Mm. This shit to this day that I'm heartbroken because I don't have nobody to talk to. Verge is the only I could post these glasses and they could be fucking from 1876, and when I post them, I could post a, this part of it, the end part of it, mm -hmm. and Virgil know what the fuck I was posting. You feel me? Yeah. It's just like, V is the vision. You feel me? That's the God, like, you feel me? And he knew, I knew, and we both knew, and that's why our connection was like this. You feel yeah. me? Virgil had, I, he had plenty of friends. But he know when he got into Louis, his little brother that told him to stop fucking with Ben Trill and get on some whole other shit. And that shit, if I didn't tell V to stop fucking with Ben Trill, he would have still been working with Ben Trill and it would have never been no off-white. Mm. You feel well, me? Pyrex before, right, too? Yeah, well, Pyrex before, yeah. It's just like, V was like, you know, he listened to me and I love him for that, bro. Yeah. That's he seemed my, to very. He seemed to have very valued bro, everything he said. That nigga loved me, and I loved him. You feel me? Yeah. That man bought me inside the Louis Vuitton office. Was like, yo, help me on this show. Like, you feel me? Set up the mood boards. Like that shit. I like that shit touched me. I cried. Like, you feel me? Like, imagine you a kid from Harlem not having shit. Like having shit, but not having shit. Then you in the fucking Louis Vuitton office. Like, you feel me? Like, that shit changed a nigga, for real, bro. Yeah. That nigga changed me, opened me. Like, you feel me? Mm -hmm. Like, like talking to Virgil was like going to school. You feel me? Amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing trivia there from Barry. It's interesting what you said about um, 
what he said about Ben Trill. It's funny because looking back on it, or even during the time, actually, there was a lot of bad sentiment around Ben Trill overall, wasn't there? It, it didn't necessarily do the best for the collective representation, the collective rep- rep- reputation of the likes of Aaron Preston, um, Matthew Williams, Virgil, Jown, Justin Saunders, you know, loosely attached. It kind of did more harm than good, really. But I felt like it was a fun platform. When I remember looking at it, I remember having the first hat that he put out with 40 ounce van with the hashtags on the front. That was pretty funny. I thought it was a pretty cool idea to have this weird kind of quasi collective boy band of designers dropping limited edition t-shirts and throwing parties and DJing. They were basically doing what kind of music we're doing, but in a way more cool and interesting way, right? Like loads of these kind of guys surrounded around the mixing. So surrounded around the mixer, fiddling knobs and fucking around playing horrible hip hop music and whatnot at clubs. Like it was really funny to see that happening in real time. And like I said, it was a real, I thought good, you know, platform to launch each of their respective careers. But I think professionally, maybe in the scene and the culture, because everybody knew the powers of those guys individually, right? Look what they've all gone to gone on to do. Heron's got his own brand. I think he's debuting at New York Fashion Week. You know, Matthew Williams is smashing it at Juvon. She's got his own brand, the leaks. Virgil obviously had his own brand off white and was heading up Louis Vuitton. I think everyone around them knew what powers they each had individually. Like, you know what? You guys can be doing way more with your talents and, you know, printing these crappy t-shirts and throwing these parties that no one cares about and that will really age really badly. And clearly it did. And if you look back at some of the pictures, they're maybe a little bit corny and lame seeing these kind of, you know, these grown-ups surrounded around the back of the booth, like pretending that they're in a boy band and stuff because they're DJing and printing t-shirts. But I don't know. I have to be real, I kind of enjoyed it. I thought it was pretty cool at the time, but clearly their friends and family did not like it in the slightest. And then I thought also the end bit was also cool, where he touches upon the v loan controversy i'm glad i'm glad akeem managed to get that question because that's one thing i was wondering so if you're not familiar towards maybe recently actually maybe a few months ago news came out via leaks and dms and whatnot the i think maybe around time when bari was going through his drama with maybe tremaine or whatever something i don't know somewhere it happened um news got out there that bari doesn't actually own vloan i think Ian Connor was throwing some jabs also because he's you know he's got his ownership of Sicko and they've clearly got some long standing beef going on. But it basically got revealed that Barry doesn't own doesn't doesn't own Vloan and somehow whoever business partner he got in business with finagled him in a situation where he essentially works for the brand and that guy kind of claims all the profits or something. And I don't know, something happened in business that basically revealed that he doesn't own it. It was a real big eye opener because, you know, we only know of Vlone because of Bari. We see him, you know, posting drop locations of himself at random places in America where he's doing random drops and pop up shops and essentially slinging t shirts out from the back of his Maybach truck. So to hear that was kind of surprising. And he basically touches upon it here in this interview and explains what happened and kind of gives a bit of a warning to designers coming up and creatives to get their business in check before they you know, indulge themselves in the lifestyle as he kind of tells it. It's a really cool and insightful piece here. And, um, yeah. and just a little bit back on V-Loan, right? There was like, what, like two months ago, there was this thing that came out that said like, oh, Bari's not a part of V-Loan mm-hmm, anymore. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, what mm-hmm. happened with that? Um, with that being said, when you come into this business, have your business on point, and make sure you take care of your business before you take care of the lifestyle. You understand? So with that being said, is I had somebody who I trusted and they signed a signature without me being noticed. You understand? So this person made they self a part of the company without me being noticed. And when the brand blows up, somebody pops up like, hey, I'm a part of this, I need this. Mm. And you looking at this person like, where the fuck you come from? You understand? Mm. You're supposed person? to be my big homie. You're supposed to be da 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 It was somebody that was my manager. Oh, wow. You know? Damn. It's somebody that I trusted that went behind my back and tried to do some funny shit and helped me with my Instagram you understand? And hacked my Instagram and now is trying to use my brand against me. Like, 
You feel me? That's crazy. This is so whack. So what's but the so so what's the future of V Loan look like? The future of V Loan is us. It's us, mm-hmm. nigga. It's worldwide. You feel me? Fashion. I'm working on my new fashion show, which should be coming up this spring. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm working on a denim line. I'm working on a shoe line. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm working on a glasses line. And I'm just continuing, you understand? And with this, like, with me being as a designer, mm-hmm. I don't drop albums. I drop masterpieces. Yeah. So anything I do is going to be a masterpiece, you feel me? So with that being said, I've just been sitting back and just working on my product, man. That's it. Working on fashion shows, working on movies, working on, I'm going to be opening up five stores in Asia. Between Fire. Japan and uh, Vilon. Vilon, okay. So Japan, China, and Korea. And then those stores open, and then I'm going to come and open up some stores in America. Yeah. That's pretty wild, isn't it? Five stores across Asia. I guess what this list, what this kind of shows or displays is that maybe his business is right over there in Asia. Because if I'm not mistaken, there is a business partnership or I think Edison Chen or something is involved in the background in terms of V Loan. I think that's why he speaks about Edison Chen very highly in this interview as well, and how much he kind of, you know, how much he kind of um, respects him as a person and a businessman and a man and whatnot. And clearly, they've got good business going on there. And if anything, if I remember correctly, one of the reasons why V Loan was successful or really popped off in a big way, I remember seeing it everywhere. Was number one, loads of kids, you know, wanting to wear it and feel like they're they're from the hood. But also loads of Asian kids really resonated with the brand. Maybe because of the big V logo, I'm not too sure. Maybe because they're obsessed with hip hop culture also. But for some reason, V Loan touched Asia in a way that I've never seen any other streetwear brand do. Especially with somebody who isn't Asian, kind of founding it. It was really interesting to see it. Um, Asian people flipping love V Loan. They love the flipping V t shirt. They love that friend of foe t shirt. They love that denim jacket with the contrast stitching. Like they love V Loan for real, for real. So it's pretty cool to see that going forward that he's doing it because i've always kind of had these kind of weird ideas in that way of kind of doing things the reverse so i remember one time when i was thinking about doing a fashion line i was thinking of starting off doing a diffusion line and then leading up to a main line but always having the main line kind of in the back of our mind so the diffusion line would always kind of inform the main line when the main line drops it'd be this kind of cool little story that you could tell and i think the same thing with what he's doing um, with v loan and bari in terms of launching stores in asia as opposed to launching something in the states maybe launching something in Harlem, in New York, or going to Atlanta, or Houston, wherever it may be, it would make more sense of where he's from. But I said he's going the opposite way and kind of branching out. Instead of doing one domestic store, he's doing an international store first, and then kind of coming back to the UK, which is a really interesting way to kind of approach um, doing retail in that way. And if anything, if you think about it, if I would go and open a store, it would be somewhere like an Asia anyway, where I said it maybe like a Middle East, where maybe the retail sector is still somewhat valued, is still somewhat on this pedestal, the experience around retail, the activations, the drops, the cues, all that malarkey adds to the law, adds to the mystique, adds to the desirability of the brand because that's essentially what kind of got it successful, right? The fact that they had these really cool limited drops that you had to kind of be in tune for and be around for to cop. So that's pretty cool to see. But I do like his advice there in terms of getting your business in order, you know, because V-Loan, V-Loan, regardless of what happens in the future, is intrinsically tied to Bari. Like, there's no one else that can basically take that forward and go with it. So to have something that is basically your namesake, something that is your baby that you've kind of nurtured from the beginning till now and then have it kind of be slipped away from your fingers because of bad business, because you are too eager to cash in on the bag or you weren't reading enough stuff or you weren't reading contracts or you weren't paying attention or you didn't do due diligence is really horrible. So, And I feel like nowadays especially... There is no excuse for it with the amount of free information out there available to kind of avoid these pitfalls and other past stories. So it's quite cool that he's being open with it at least and sharing what happened to him and basically saying, hey, make sure you get your business in check and make sure everything's okay before you get into business with these people because you could get finagled out of your brand. But I recommend you check it out. Really cool interview there. ASAP Bari interview, Vlone, ASAP Rocky Yams, Fashion Playboy, Carly Virgil and more. Definitely cool insights on there. So check it out if you haven't already. It's a really, really interesting interview. And it also 
also made me think randomly about the fashion show that he put together for Vlone that I felt like was a real missed opportunity to kind of progress the brand forward. Don't get me wrong, it probably, you know, the reason probably he didn't continue doing this stuff because I'm sure soon after this is when all the whole sexual misconduct allegations happened when he did whatever he did in that hotel room. So that may have maybe added to it and the fact that Nike dropped him. But I thought this show featuring Little Peep was definitely... Um, one of those shows that should have been the start of really cool and interesting things going forward but if anything I feel like Vlon has kind of stagnated he hasn't necessarily progressed since this point when they showed the Vlon during Paris Fashion Week for spring 2018 I don't feel like it's really progressed anywhere forward past this event or past this moment so hopefully going forward I'm interested to see if he's able to kind of evolve the brand and take it forward a bit more because I think it has a lot of potential but you know, you've got to see that potential first going forward. But this show was a real big moment. You know, little peep kind of on the runway. We saw the Nike, the solos of cut and sew. We saw the debut of the denim suit, um, the flipping, the, the, the jacket and the pants. Um, we saw obviously cool installation or cool kind of runway installation art thing where you had, if I'm not mistaken, some sort of... Um, I think he had a Damien Hurst piece or something that he did in a Damien Hurst style. And from in, from from Hyde, some reason this thing isn't loading. I don't know why. What's happening here? Is it crashing? Yeah, there you go. Anyway, cool. But you know what I mean. You can see the vibes here. You can see the vibes, all the pictures over there. But yeah, hopefully that happens going forward. And we we'll see some more stuff from from B Learn. But yeah, it looks pretty cool, man. It looks pretty cool. Check out the interview if you haven't already. It's a really cool one there on our generation music now anyway that has been oh no let's no let's square this we got this and then of course of course we have to finish a show talking about the manchester derby that happened this past weekend united won 2-1 man at home against man city what an amazing game of football what a great time it was um to watch my team actually compete and you know eventually win against man city considering all the recent you know matches that we have against them when they absolutely batter us if anything this is definitely a sign that we're definitely going in the right direction it definitely puts us in contention with a title challenge which i don't think is possible i think a title challenge this season is a bit of a stretch we still have many holes in our squad to plug as uh, many sorry gaps in our in our squad to plug there's still certain circumstances with chelsea going through a real transition period liverpool clearly kind of um you know essentially um, not matching the heights that they've done in previous seasons so it's a bit of a weird season this season but it's still something to kind of be happy about that me united are able to compete with these top teams despite all the holes that we currently got in a place that we need to progress in and it's definitely definitely a good indictment and definitely a good understanding that we're in the right direction with it to eric ten hag eric ten hag is definitely um shown us what the levels are being a top coach and definitely reminded us that man, even myself i've also somebody that kind of felt like Maybe because the Glazers are leaving, but I was someone that felt to myself, like, even with the Glazers in charge, there's no ability, there's no possibility ever of us winning a league or a big trophy with them in charge because they're so, you know, inept in what they do and the organisation is so messed up that you're going to need to have a genius Sarah Ferguson type manager to come in in order for us to kind of win great things. No one's saying Eric Ten Hag is Sarah Ferguson reincarnated, but what he is, is a top level coach that's shown us that maybe the the process of rebuilding United isn't as far-fetched as I once thought it was. I was under the impression that it would take at least a minimum of five years to get us back to competing. But clearly, just having a good coach with a few good signings, with a couple of his young players, instilling a good mentality and discipline into a squad and teamwork and hard work and you know commitment and whatnot, we've definitely changed the whole profile of the team to the point where players that were much derided, like Rashford's and stuff in previous seasons, have now become our main if not important players people like Bruno Fernandes who I'm still not sold on has kind of changed his way in some ways it's been a really cool development to see this coming forward in real time I'm not going to lie so I'm definitely happy to see that and again the game was incredibly entertaining um, it was good to see us control parts of it it was good to see us discipline in terms of organization in terms of defending um luke Shaw playing center back you know alongside rafa Varane is still something i'm kind of getting used to but it's great to see because i've been somebody that always has kind of championed his defending but have been really questioned he's kind of valuing the squad if he can't attack or really provide us any out ball going forward and left back but clearly his defending is still top notch he's still basically keeping um what's his face 
the Sandra Martinez on the bench, even though he's back from the World Cup and clearly fit and ready to go. Luke Shaw is basically keeping one of our starting centre backs off the pitch by playing so well alongside Varane in the centre. The utilisation of subs, the squad. You know, we had a double pivot of Casemiro and flipping Fred playing against Man City. That was absolutely stupendous. Fred basically bossed the game and kind of, with the exception of a couple of occasions, marked KDB out of the game completely. It was a real complete performance overall. I really, really did enjoy it. I'm not going to lie going forward. So definitely something that I'm eager to see happening going forward and see if we end up mounting a real title challenge in the future. But anyway, that's been the Excellent Zika Show episode number... Was it 641, I think? Thanks so much for tuning in. As per usual, it's been a pleasure to have your company. We will be heading out this pod listening to my tune of the day. It will definitely be a song from Baby Drill, somebody who I got put on by, you know, ASAP Bari, actually, in that interview with Our Generation Music. So definitely check out that interview. So I'll be playing a track from the album Drill Season Extended from Baby Drill as my tune of the day. I'm not sure which one, but I'll decide when I do edit this podcast. And if you're listening or watching this via the video, Person of it what are you doing why don't you jump on and listen to the audio side so you can hear my tune of the day do that also and while you're at it make sure you rate and subscribe that'll be also good but yeah check me out i'll be here again very very soon thank you all for tuning in and hope you have a splendid rest of the day or week or whatever you listen to this take care be safe peace